Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure for me to be here with you today. My name is Laura Lara Castor. I am a PhD candidate at the Nutritional Epidemiology and uh, Data Science program here at Tufts University. I want to introduce you to Dr. Darius Mosafarian. He's a cardiologist, a special advisor to the provost, dean for policy, and Jean Mayer professor at the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, and professor of medicine at Tufts School of Medicine. He'll be talking to you, to us, to, on the, the, under the session of Spotlights on Nutrition with his talk titled Lessons Learned for Translating Research into Policy. Dari, I give the floor to you. Uh, thank you so much, Laura. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Uh, congratulations to uh, our Friedman School graduate students for putting on another terrific symposium. This has become a wonderful international event. Uh, and um, I'm going to be speaking about you know, how we think about translating science to policy. It's one of the most exciting things about the Friedman School uh, is this link between science and policy. It's in our name, the, the School of Nutrition, Science and Policy. Uh, and as I'll show you in my talk, this really comes, it, it's built into our DNA based on the work of Jean Mayer, the founder of our school and his work uh, integrating uh, science and policy. So I'm gonna share my slides. Great. So, you know, first, just to highlight, I think most people in the audience know this, but why, why do we care about, you know, uh, fixing food with policy? It's because this is the top cause of poor health in, in, our, in the United States and around the world. This is a chart looking at just the United States, looking at the hundreds of thousands of deaths uh, each year in the United States and at the top causes of those deaths, with different colors being different types of deaths, for example, cardiovascular disease or cancer or other things. And you can see in the United States, and indeed in almost every country in the world, poor diet is the top cause of poor health. So we absolutely have to address poor nutrition through systems change and through policy change. In the United States, this has become such a problem that more Americans are sick than are healthy. One in two adults have diabetes or prediabetes. One in two have a lifetime risk of cancer. Three in four have overweight or obesity. And if you add blood pressure and cholesterol levels, only one in 15 adults in the United States are metabolically healthy. Think about that. 14 out of 15 adults are walking around sick. Uh, uh, and a lot of this is due to poor nutrition. And this is true among children. One in four American teenagers have prediabetes. One in four have overweight or obesity. And one in six have fatty liver disease. And this is crushing the economy. And, and I think this is very important to not just talk about the health harms of food, um, or the environmental harms of food, but to talk about the economic harms, because this is what moves policy. If we want to translate research to policy, we have to get to the bottom line, which is which is dollars. In 50 years in the United States, healthcare costs have skyrocketed from 7% of the economy to 18% of the economy, from just one in $20 in the federal budget to nearly one in $3 in the federal budget, a huge increase in, in, in the government budget. Um, from $80 billion to $1.2 trillion for U.S. businesses who pay for health care. And so today, for every person in the United States, we spend $12,000 per year on health care. For a family of four, that's $48,000 per year, much, much more than the average family spends on housing, food, and transportation combined. And so we are absolutely drowning in health care spending. Most of this is due to preventable chronic diseases. And much of that is related to poor nutrition. And an analysis by the Rockefeller Foundation um, recently uh, uh, estimated that just from the, the adverse human health consequences of poor diet, um, that the US economy loses over a trillion dollars every year. And if you add in the environment uh, and biodiversity and lost livelihoods, it's another trillion dollars. So the, the food system is losing the US economy $2 trillion every, every year. And COVID has put an exclamation point on this because COVID is much, much worse in people with diet-related diseases, people who have obesity, diabetes, or hypertension in particular. And the reason for that is that obesity, diabetes, and hypertension are vascular diseases, diseases of vascular dysfunction with systemic inflammation. And COVID is a virus that attacks our blood vessels and causes systemic inflammation. And so you have a virus that's not just a lung virus, a virus that attacks the blood vessels and causes inflammation, uh, hitting a population that has widespread diseases of vascular dysfunction and inflammation. So COVID has, has been a fast pandemic on a slow pandemic of obesity and diabetes. It's been like pouring 
gasoline on a smoldering fire. Now the public gets this, and so if we want to think about translating science to policy, the public has to be aware and interested, and they're also confused. And so this is an opportunity and a challenge. It's an opportunity because the public really is, is going crazy, is hungering for trusted science and trusted information. So that makes it an opportunity, but it's also a challenge because you get uh, incredibly um, uh, varied and often misinformed impressions of the public of what is and what is not a healthier choice or healthier food, which makes progress challenging. Um, but fortunately, the science has uh, it, uh, really dramatically accelerated. And so if we look at the science uh, of nutrition and chronic diseases over the last 60 years, we see there's been an explosion of science. What this chart shows is the number of scientific publications in every decade from 1960 to 2020 on diet and cardiovascular disease, diet and diabetes, and diet and obesity. And you can see that the science is basically doubling every decade. And so much of what we've learned built on the foundation of the science of the last century, much of what we've learned, we've learned since 2000. And so this is what you know, is exciting to me is how do we take this new science from 2000 forward and translate it into policy? And, and so first, just what have we learned? What, what is the science we need to translate? Well, first, we've learned that there are foods that are good for us. There's foods that are kind of more neutral and there are foods that are bad for us. And so this is a very different message than eat everything in moderation. This is, this is really about picking winners and picking losers. And so first, there are protective foods, minimally processed, bioactive rich, fiber rich foods that protect the gut microbiome, protect our metabolism, protect our brains, protect our blood vessels and hearts fruits, nuts, fish, vegetables, plant oils, whole grains, beans, and yogurt. Uh, then there are foods to eat in moderation. Um, you know, we can't uh, eat only the highest and most protective foods. We have to have a varied diet. And so, you know, we do. it's okay if, if you choose to eat minimally processed animal products in moderation, cheese, poultry, milk, eggs, butter, and unprocessed red meats. And then the worst foods in the food supply are the highly processed refined grains, starches, and sugars, processed meats, other high sodium foods and other highly processed foods with tons of additives like such as trans fat. And so this is kind of where we have to translate the science and, I, and I, into policy. And I think this is very important because most of the policy to date has focused on the negatives, the, on the negatives in food. How do we eliminate sugar? How do we eliminate some types of fat? How do we eliminate uh, salt? And you see policies around the, around the world doing this. There are black box warning labels in Chile and Brazil and uh, Mexico and other countries. There are traffic light labels in the United Kingdom and other places that highlight the negatives. It's all about the negatives. So we do want people to eat less of this, but we want mostly people to eat more of this. And this is where I think the translation of, of science to policy has been missing mostly from, from food policy. We haven't done enough to think about how do we increase the protective foods in the food supply putting a black box warning label or a traffic light with about salt content on a product does not actually get healthier foods into the food supply. And that's really, I think has to be the primary focus. And I think the second thing we've learned beyond you know, the fact that there are foods that are really, really good for us, protective foods, is that we have to move away from calories as a target. For 30, 40 years, the world has faced an obesity epidemic. And for 30, 40 years, the policy response has been to tell people to have less calories, put calories on the restaurant menu labels, put calories on the back of the package, tell people to count calories. And we're learning more and more that that's not a successful long-term strategy because uh, calorie for calorie, foods have very different long-term effects on obesity risk. And so you can't judge a food by its calorie count alone because different foods based on how they're processed, based on their nutrients, uh, based on their food structure have different effects on not only hunger and fullness and conscious eating, but also all of the unconscious biologic processes that aren't really about you know, how we feel when we eat. It's unconscious biology, glucose, insulin, liver fat synthesis, brain reward, the gut microbiome, and, and more. A third lesson is that we've learned is that food's really complicated. And, and if we want to look at food and health, we have to move beyond just a single outcome. We can't just make all our decisions based on a single outcome. What do I mean by that? Well, um, in the 1980s, the major focus of nutrition policy was to improve blood cholesterol levels, and that led to the low-fat diet. And today, 
the major focus is on obesity, which, which leads people to talk about added sugar uh, and calories as two major priorities. And all of that's fine. I mean, we do need to improve blood cholesterol and improve obesity, but we also need to think about nutrition and blood pressure, the liver, inflammation, the brain, the gut, the fat cells, the heart, clotting, uh, and much, much more. And so we can't oversimplify by just focusing on one or two outcomes. We really have to have a holistic view of nutrition and health. Um, the other thing we've learned is that food is much, there's much more to think about beyond nutrients. And so we have to understand processing. And I think this is really one of the biggest and most interesting uh, and uncertain, uncertain areas of nutrition science right now is what is it about processing of foods that's bad? And what is it that we have to fix? Because we have to process foods. We, we can't eat all foods raw or, and minimally processed. So we have to figure out what have we done in the last 50 or 60 years that's been harmful for food processing and fix that. And this is a trial that was done at the National Institutes of Health that's compared an ultra processed diet in blue versus an unprocessed diet in red. So the ultra processed diet was foods made by industry, um, highly refined and, and processed, and the unprocessed was foods that were, were you know, more, more closer to their natural structure and natural state. But the diets were not different in fat, in sugar, in salt, in carbohydrate content, in protein content, in fiber content, in even taste or energy density. The diets were matched in all of those things. So it wasn't comparing, you know, super high sugar, high salt, um, you know, energy dense foods to others. It was, it was all of those things were matched. The only real major difference was the processing. And what this trial showed is even though the diets were matched in all these nutrient characteristics, people without realizing it unconsciously ate about four to 500 more calories every day on the ultra processed diets versus the unprocessed diets. And they gained weight without even thinking about it. In, in just two weeks, they gained a kilogram. That's 2.2 pounds, about a pound a week. They gained a pound a week without even realizing it. And in contrast, without even trying to lose weight, they lost a pound a week uh, on the unprocessed diet. Um, and, so, and so this is really, really important. This is another major lesson that we've learned. Um, so at the end of the day, if we think about those four lessons, that it's really about protective foods, that uh, we can't just focus on calories, that nutrition is complicated, we can't just think about blood lipids or, or obesity, and that we have to understand food processing, that means a lot of the current areas of focus, both for marketing and for policy, are misleading. Low calorie doesn't mean less weight gain, fat-free doesn't mean healthy, low saturated fat doesn't mean healthy, and vitamin fortified doesn't mean good for you. And, and I say this because not only are industry marketing these terms, but, but policies are focusing on these things, low calorie, fat-free, and low saturated fat and getting your vitamins. And so that, so both policy and industry is, is still, I think, focusing on these outdated goals. So how do we have to translate research into policy? We, we do a lot of work on this at Tufts in my uh, research group and, and others. And um, some of the links are down here at the bottom of the page, foodprice.org and informingwhc.org. You know, please go to those websites and, and look at some of this work and reports. But it's really clear that if we want to get to a food system that's healthy and equitable and sustainable, we have to do a lot more than put a black box warning label on a food that, that has too much salt. We have to do a lot more than dietary guidelines. We have to do a lot more than making sure there's nutrition education in schools those things are not gonna really move the needle that much. Um, we have to do have a comprehensive approach to addressing the food system. And so there are six domains of action that are really evidence-based uh, and I think are really exciting for policy change in food. And this is focused on the United States. Uh, I'm gonna focus on the United States, but all of this has global implications. All of this can be you know, translated to other countries. So first, the government nutrition programs. Most governments in the world spend a lot of money uh, helping to get food to those who are, are less, less fortunate financially. Uh, the United States does this. We have to make sure those foods are healthy. That includes nutrition school meals and SNAP and WIC, other programs, procurement standards. You know, when, when the government uh, buys food for, um, you know, cafeterias, for the military, for jails, for office workers, for national parks, right? The, the government should be uh, you know, purchasing healthy foods. Second is public health and education. And that means, yes, focusing on limits on salt and added sugar and front to pack labels, but also dietary guidelines, uh, uh, standards on marketing to children, 
helping companies with qualified health claims, uh, you know, doing uh, community-wide efforts and prevention efforts and surveillance. Um, I think two of the most exciting areas are in the center here, uh, innovations in healthcare and innovations in science and research. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this, but there are really exciting policy innovations going on where research is being translated into changes to healthcare, where now you can go to your doctor and your doctor won't just prescribe a medication, but she will prescribe uh, a meal or she will prescribe a fruit or vegetable for her patient. And that's really, really exciting. So I'll talk more about this. And I'll talk a little bit more about science and research. A, a big part of policy change is to have more funding for science. And so there has to be a virtuous positive feedback loop, more science, positive policy, policy change for, for more, more uh, funding, and then, and then uh, more science to help improve health. And then two other areas that I think are really important uh, to translate research into policy is business innovation. Um, you know, the food sector is not the tobacco sector where we just want to put it out of business. Um, we need the food system. We need the farms. We need the supply chains. We need the food manufacturers. We need the retailers. We need the restaurants. But we have to have them sell healthier food. We have to have it be equitably uh, accessible. Uh, we have to have it be sustainably sourced. We have to have them be profitable. Um, and so it's not the same as just putting tobacco out of business. And so we really have to push forward business innovation with uh, clear policies that advance business innovation, um, including ways to expand the market for healthier products, giving tax benefits for innovation, uh, having metrics around uh, uh, investing so that socially conscious investors can invest in food companies that are doing better work, supporting traditionally marginalized uh, 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 subgroups like uh, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, 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 who uh, are often food entrepreneurs, uh, expanding the use of B corporation status, like Patagonia has been the biggest B corporation in the world. Now Nestle is saying they want to become the biggest B corporation in the world and more. And then lastly, we need a plan. And I'll talk briefly about this. If you want to translate research to policy, it can't be piece by piece, a little bit here, a little bit there, there actually has to be a national strategy so that this all works together. So um, let me just give you some examples of, of how in the United States, research has been translated into policy. The, the current food system that we have today, in fact, um, is a very conscious creation of translating science into policy. The food system we have today is not an accident. The food system we have today was not a, a plot by industry to make us all sick and, and to make money. The food system we have today was a very conscious creation of, of, uh, uh, of um, su supply chains, crops, food processing, everything that we do today was very consciously created to meet the scientific goals of the 20th century. And so, you know, what I, what I like to, to, think, to think about is that we have a, a 20th century food system but with 21st century problems. And so how did, how did we build this 20th century system? Well, there were three major things that happened in the 20th century that drove policy. First was the discovery of vitamins in really the 1920s and 1930s, the discovery of vitamins. Vitamins weren't known until before the 1920s and the 1930s. So it's been less than hundred years. That led to the first real clear recognition of vitamin deficiency diseases like pellagra, scurvy, beriberi, rickets, that those could be cured by getting people the right vitamins. And what happened at the same time was World War II. Um, and so at the same time that there was the discovery of vitamins, there was World War II where there was tremendous fear and concern about sufficient food. And this, you know, we think about the war in Ukraine and the uh, disruptions that that has caused that's nothing compared to what happened in World War II. Uh, in World War II, it's estimated that uh, maybe 16 million people died of, of starvation during World War II. 16 million people died in just the Soviet Union, seven to nine million people died. In India, two million people died. In China, two million people died. In Java, about two million people died. In Vietnam, about a million. In Greece, 300,000. In Austria, 100,000. There were millions of people dying because of lack of food. And so this combination of the discovery of vitamins, which was all about too little nutrition, and famine um, really terrified policymakers and led to some major policy changes to think about having a, a healthy food supply with the right amount of vitamins. And so, and so, for example, one of the major things that happened was in 1941, going into war, President Franklin D. Roosevelt 
looked at the science about vitamin deficiency diseases. He said, we need to have a healthy population going to war. And so he said, we have to have a national plan for coordinating the programs and activities of national, state, and local public and private agencies into a unified program for the promotion of better nutrition. And he put his federal security administrator, who was really uh, in, in charge of a lot of the war effort, in charge of this conference. And it was called the National Nutrition Conference for Defense. And it led to several major national actions, all focused on vitamins. It actually led to new national standards and expansion of vitamin enriched flour. And so today, as you probably know, 95% of, of, of white flour in the United States is enriched with folate and, and other B vitamins. That's because of the 1941 uh, conference. It also led to the first RDAs. The RDAs, which are on the back of all the food packages, didn't exist before this, this conference. And so the 1941 RDAs came out of this conference, the idea that there were minimum amounts and, and maximum amounts of different vitamins that we had to eat. And then based on that, the first actual nutrient-based dietary guidelines came out uh, around 1950. So for the first time ever, dietary guidelines weren't just, well, you know, eat a variety of foods. It was actually based on on, on the science of vitamin deficiency diseases. And so, and so this is a really clear example of how war and concern about vitamin deficiencies and, and led to major uh, translation of research uh, into policy. Well, what else happened in, in the last century? You know, beyond the war uh, and beyond the discovery of vitamins, there was a global population explosion. If you look at the world population from 1700 to today, the world population was slowly growing, slowly growing, slowly growing. And look what happens after about 1940, uh, 1950, a massive, massive explosion in the world population. We went from about one and a half billion people in 1900 to six billion people in 2000. More people have been born in the last hundred years than in all of human history combined. Uh, and there was a lot of predictions that we would not have enough food. This book was published in the 1960s, The Population Bomb, by Dr. Paul Ehrlich, and it said, um, you know, hundreds of millions of people are going to starve in the next few decades. We don't have enough food, and we have to to figure that out and address that. So there was tremendous fear uh, around 1960 of, of that we were going to have a massive, massive uh, 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 starvation of the, of the world's population. And so what happened? The Green Revolution, the Rockefeller Foundation, the U.S. government, the government of Mexico, the government of India, the government of Pakistan, many other governments poured millions and millions of dollars into crop um, uh, science and agricultural science to increase crop yields and to increase production of calories. And that led to the global monocropping of crops. We have all these industrial fields that people criticize now, all these large industrial farms around the world, monocropping of wheat, rice, uh, uh, and, and, and maize. That was a conscious creation because of fear of famine. And so if you look at, in the United States at yields per acre, the yield of corn per acre, you see from 1860 to 1950, there was no change, no change, about 30 bushels of corn per acre. Look what happened with the Green Revolution, an incredible increase in yields per acre. And this happened around the world in every country in the world. And so from around, 19, <clears throat> around 1960, India was in tremendous, uh, uh, um, under tremendous pressure for famine. By 1970, 10 years later, India was exporting uh, wheat uh, and rice. So incredible uh, uh, revolution uh, in, in industry. And so that you know, focus on hunger, that focus on famine also changed US policy. And so in the 1960s, again, when there was this tremendous fear about famine and starvation, there was a lot of focus on hunger in America, including a CBS documentary, Senators like Robert F. Kennedy visiting poor families, uh, magazine uh, articles focusing on hunger. And that led to the second major US um, policy effort where science of the science around hunger and famine was translated into policy. And Dr. Jean Mayer, who's pictured here, who founded our school, um, was the organizer of this 1969 conference with President Nixon. And this conference, because of the focus on hunger, uh, led to major changes in how we get calories to people, major expansion of food stamps, major expansion of the school lunch program, creation of WIC, creation of school breakfast, creation of nutrition facts panels, and creation of the modern dietary guidelines process. So again, a clear example where, where things on the, uh, in, in science about, about a growing population and famine and hunger um, changed a U.S. policy. So 
when we look today at our you know, food system, again, we have a 20th century food system with 21st century problems. When you look at this, the global monocropping of crops, when you look at the cereal aisle with all of these inexpensive, starch-rich, vitamin-fortified foods, this is not an accident. This happened because of conscious policy decisions um, that happened in the last century. And I'm not criticizing those decisions. I want to emphasize that. We shouldn't criticize those decisions. These uh, um, policy actions were very, very effective. And so vitamin deficiency diseases were dramatically reduced in the United States and, and around the world. In the United States in the 1930s, 70 or 80 percent of African-American children in New York were thought to have pellagra. In New York in the 19, in, in London, excuse me, in London in the, in the early 1900s, 70 or 80 percent of children in some schools had pellagra. Vitamin deficiency diseases were, were very common. And these uh, activities largely uh, re eliminated vitamin deficiency diseases in wealthier countries and greatly reduced them in other nations. And the Green Revolution dramatically reduced hunger. Hunger is, is, is at its you know, lowest level as a percentage of the population uh, in, in you know, at least a couple of hundred years. Uh, and famine is much, much lower than it was prior to the Green Revolution. Uh, and so by some estimates, maybe a billion people were, were protected from starvation because of the Green Revolution. And so, so these uh, policy activities achieve their goals of getting enough calories to people and getting enough vitamins to people. That's why this cereal aisle looks like it does today. It's starch, starchy, cheap, vitamin fortified calories. That was the goal. But now we have 21st century problems as I outlined. And so now we need a new plan, a new way to translate the new research into policy. So, you know, one way to do this is to work directly with the national government. And so at Tufts over the last uh, a few years, we've been working to try to um, uh, stimulate and, and um, recommend and uh, have the, 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 the Biden administration agree to host an, another White House conference. The last one was over 50 years ago in 1969. And so we put together a task force a couple of years ago with uh, Chef Jose Andres, uh, Ambassador Earthrin Cousin, former Senate Majority Leader and, and, and Physician Bill Frist and former USDA Agriculture Secretary Dan Glickman. And through this task force, we said, look, how are we gonna translate this science into policy? And so um, we, we built a larger task force of about 20 individuals who would inform uh, uh, actions and information to the government. We held about uh, uh, 20 listening sessions around the country. Uh, with people from mostly low income and, and minority backgrounds to really understand, you know, what is it like for people with lived experience in, in food insecurity, uh, in poor nutrition and diet related diseases? What are they thinking about? Uh, and we held three national convenings around the country in New York and Oakland and in Washington, DC. We also uh, solicited and, and read over 75 policy reports from other organizations that had put out policy reports around food and we put it all together into a bipartisan um, report that includes uh, representatives from business, includes representatives from Republican and Democratic backgrounds, includes government, includes uh, scientific experts, physicians, clinical experts, people who are focused on equity uh, and uh, community engagement. So we really wanted to create the, the, the first kind of multinational bipartisan multi-sector report on US and food policy since 1969. And I encourage all of you to actually read the report. I think uh, it's an excellent report of very practical recommendations. And we went to the White House and we shared these recommendations and we said, you know, here's 30 policy recommendations that we think we can end hunger, advance nutrition and improve health in the United States. And through our work and the work of others, there were other groups involved as well, of course. Uh, the White House did hold a White House conference and come out uh, with a national strategy. Um, I, I want to mention before I get to that, that we also went and found supporters uh, around the country, supportive organizations to show the government that, you know, this isn't just our task force. And so this is a list of, of organizations that have that su have support our goals and our priorities to advance nutrition science, to advance food as medicine, uh, and to um, uh, advance uh, nutrition security uh, in, in our food system through policy. And it includes clinical organizations, businesses, nonprofits, academic organizations, and, and more. And so this was also important to show that, you know, there's a, a diverse coalition of organizations that actually care about these issues. And uh, President Biden, uh, with 
bipartisan support from Congress, um, hosted the White House Conference uh, on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. Uh, Congressman Jim McGovern from Massachusetts was, was one of the most important champions for this. Um, he's been talking about this for at least 10 years. Uh, and it was also supported by the late Congresswoman Jackie Walorski and Senators uh, Booker and Braun. And so bipartisan support from the House uh, and the Senate. Uh, and importantly, uh, Ambassador Susan Rice, who leads the domestic policy of the United States, was also a champion for this. And so this, this conference was held and a national strategy was published with five pillars of how over the next 10 years, the US government is going to improve food access and affordability, integrate nutrition and health, empower all consumers to, to make and have access to healthy choices, support physical activity and enhance uh, research. So why is policy important? So I've told you that, that you know, there have been all these policy actions and I gave you examples from the 1940s and the 19, 1970s. I wanna give you a more modern example to, to show you why science and policy are so important. This is a paper that we published a couple of years ago looking at diet quality of foods as consumed uh, from different sources, not the food that's available, but the food that's actually purchased and consumed from different sources. We looked at restaurants, grocery stores, schools and children, and other sources. And what this chart shows you is the percentage of food of poor nutritional quality consumed by US children. You see restaurants are the worst. About 80% of all food consumed in restaurants in the United States uh, is of poor nutritional quality. That's really, really bad. Um, you can see grocery stores, um, are not great. Um, about half of all food consumed from grocery stores is of poor nutritional quality. It has gotten a little better. It was about 55% in 2003, and by 2018, it's about 45%. So that is uh, gotten, it has gotten better. Uh, in contrast, food from other sources, which is entertainment venues, food trucks, you know, other sources, has gotten worse. Uh, only about 40% was of poor nutritional quality. Now, 50% is of poor nutritional quality. But now look at schools. Look how different schools look. From 2003 to 2010, about 55 to 60 percent of food in schools was of poor nutritional quality. More than half of all food in schools was of poor nutritional quality. After 2010, there was a rapid improvement in nutritional quality of food from schools, so that by 2018, it was only about 25 percent. And today, schools are actually the healthiest overall place that, that kids eat, healthier than grocery stores, restaurants, or other sources. So what happened? Why do schools look so different than these other pretty flat trends? Well, what happened was a single law, a single law passed in Congress in 2010, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act uh, that, that was passed with the support of First Lady Michelle Obama, Mission Readiness, uh, other advocacy organizations that improved the nutritional standards of school meals. And so you can see one policy changed and improved the nutrition for millions and millions of American children over just a few years. In contrast, everything else we did, everything else we did over this period, marketing standards, the work of the FDA, the dietary guidelines, everything else we did is basically the other graphs. What, what, what you see in restaurants, what you see in grocery stores, what you see in other sources. On average, not much, not much happened over 20 years. So, so it just shows you the power of policy and why I think policy is so powerful to improving nutrition. So let's get into details of some of the national strategy. I'm not gonna go into the whole uh, national strategy, but I'll just give you some of the details. I think one of the most exciting areas um, is integrating nutrition into health. And, and this has been called food as medicine, getting uh, food-based interventions for treatment of disease and for prevention of disease into the healthcare system. This includes things like medically tailored meals, medically tailored groceries, produce prescription programs, um, and connecting patients through the hospital to nutrition security programs, all of that accompanied by nutrition counseling and education. And of course, integrating nutrition and health, there's also, it's important to have population level healthy food policies and programs, whether that's at community levels, at state levels, or at national levels. And so this is really exciting and where I think the research is, is very quickly being translated uh, into policy. Um, we've done work, for example, um, this is no longer in press, this is now published by one of uh, 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 Friedman doctoral students, Kurt Hager, uh, who's now a clinical instructor at, at UMass, uh, the UMass uh, Medical School. Um, and so we published a paper looking at medically tailored meals, which was at the top of that pyramid. And we, we did a modeling simulation study, and we said that there are about 6 million eligible Americans who would be eligible for getting uh, home, home delivered 
nutritious meals uh, delivered to them for free because they have significant illness um, and significant limitations of activities of daily living. We uh, estimated that these programs on average give about 10 meals per week, uh, an average of eight months per year, and the average cost of the meal is about $9.30. Um, based on interventional studies, these meals reduce healthcare spending. They reduce healthcare spending by about 20%, and they reduce hospitalizations by almost 50%. And what we found is just at one year, if all 6 million eligible Americans receive these medically tailored meals, just at one year, the program would cost about 25 billion, but it would prevent 1.6 million hospitalizations. It would save $39 billion in healthcare spending. And so net savings of $14 billion for the country in healthcare for implementing medically tailored meals. And if we did this for 10 years and all eligible Americans got the program for an average of eight months a year for 10 years, we'd actually save 18 million hospitalizations and save $185 billion. And so this is the kind of research then that helps translate um, findings into policy, because as I mentioned at the beginning, we're not just talking about health benefits, we're showing policymakers, healthcare systems, the economic benefits of acting. Um, there's also been work that, that we've done on produce prescription programs, which is not giving people fully prepared meals, but, but having a doctor uh, write a prescription for fruits and vegetables and maybe whole grains or beans and having insurance pay for some or all of that. And in a meta-analysis of intervention studies, uh, these programs work. Uh, fruit and vegetable intake goes up, BMI goes down, hemoglobin A1C, a marker of, of glucose control uh, goes down, uh, uh, of, of, of abnormal glucose goes down. Uh, and so these programs also work. And um, this is in the national strategy. So if you look at the national strategy that came out of the White House, um, they talk about all of these things. They want to increase food as medicine in Medicare and Medicaid, including medically tailored meals, produce prescriptions, and RDN counseling, increase produce prescriptions in the Indian Health Service and Veterans Affairs, increase access to the diabetes prevention program, increase screening for food security and other social determinants of health, creating a stronger, more diverse RDN workforce, increasing nutrition training for doctors and other medical providers. So, so the national strategy has really integrated food as medicine into uh, its program. Uh, and they also, the national strategy calls for states to act, right? They say the federal government can't do this by themselves. So states and, and the private sector have to act. And so this is again, out of the national strategy, uh, asking states to leverage all available federal authorities to expand coverage, to collaborate with nonprofit and community organizations to do food as medicine, that local and territory governments should integrate nutrition into their expertise, and that hospitals and clinics and health centers should do this, and that health professional schools should expand nutrition education uh, for, for doctors. So, so they're calling, the national strategy calls for states and health systems and uh, medical schools and, and other hospitals to actually help and, and help achieve these, these goals. And this is happening, this is happening in real time. And so Kaiser Permanente has committed $50 million to expand their food as medicine program. The Rockefeller Foundation and the American Heart Association have committed a quarter of a billion dollars to advance food as medicine research. The American Academy of Pediatrics and Share Our Strength are going to offer training to nearly 70,000 pediatricians on screening for nutrition insecurity and referring them to resources. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine is going to donate nutrition training and food as medicine courses to 100,000 healthcare providers. Food Corps is going to provide a quarter of a billion dollars over 10 years of free healthy school meals to, to kids. Uh, Instacart Health, uh, uh, which is a major online grocer, is, going, is committed to new programs or partnerships to increase nutrition security and healthier choices and improve health outcomes. And states are taking action too. So that was the private sector. Um, Massachusetts, North Carolina, California, Oregon, Arizona, Arkansas, New Mexico, multiple states have applied for what are called waivers to test new approaches in Medicaid to uh, implement uh, uh, new ways to help people improve their health, which includes food is medicine. And so $150 million in Massachusetts, $650 million in North Carolina, uh, over a billion dollars in California um, is, includes interventions to improve nutrition through the healthcare system. So really exciting things happening uh, in the states. Um, I'll skip that for, for time. Um, so, um, so I think, uh, you know, I want to move ahead and, and um, you know, talk a little bit about a couple of other issues and then end and leave time for questions. I mentioned there's other things in the national strategy. There's points about enhancing nutrition research. And so there's a lot of great recommendations that I hope will be implemented to advance nutrition science uh, and more funding for nutrition science. Uh, these are some of the things that the NIH has already done. 
a new strategic plan, a new office of nutrition research, a new program on nutrition for precision health. And it's really, uh, I'm, I'm really proud that the Human Nutrition Research Center at, at Tufts is part of this uh, program, Nutrition for Precision Health. Um, there are some things that I think aren't uh, emphasized in the national strategy. I wanna mention those too. I don't think there's enough about catalyzing business innovation. Our independent task force report had a lot about the role of the government for catalyzing business innovation. The government catalyzed business innovation in agriculture uh, in the last century. I told you about that. The government catalyzed business innovation in railroads you know, uh, 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 more than 100 years ago. Today, the government is investing a lot of money to catalyze business innovation in green energy and renewable energy, and also now in silicon chips and technology. So clearly the government can create large programs to catalyze business innovation. They need to do this for food. They need to do this for food to, to help uh, uh, promote and reward companies that are doing the right thing uh, to trying to, to push forward a more nutritious uh, and equitable and sustainable food. Um, and the other thing that, that is not really in the national strategy as much as I think it could be is coordination. I mentioned one of the six domains is coordination. You have to have a plan. Um, you actually uh, can't do all these things separately. Uh, you have to have a coordinator for the plan. And a 2021 report from the federal government, from the Government Accountability Office, which is in a very important auditing uh, agency, audited the federal government's own policies. And what they concluded was that chronic diet-related health conditions are costly, deadly, and preventable. They found 200 different federal efforts spread across 21 agencies that are trying to improve Americans' diets, and they concluded the efforts are fragmented, keeping the government from meeting its goals. And the own government report, its own report concluded that a federal strategy is needed for diet-related efforts to provide sustained leadership and improve uh, cost-effective outcomes for reducing diet-related chronic health conditions. And they recommended that Congress identify and direct a federal entity, a federal entity to lead development and implementation of a strategy. And so I think this is still missing. We don't really have a single federal entity who can really take this on. And we have proposed uh, a new office of the National Director of Food and Nutrition that is built on the, the um, precedent of the office of the National, uh, of the Director of National Intelligence. Um, after September 11th, after the, the terrorist attacks on September 11th, Congress created the Office of the Director of National Intelligence to coordinate the FBI, the CIA, you know, the National Security Council, all of the U.S. intelligence efforts. That office has been extremely successful. We believe it's time for an office of the National Director of Food and Nutrition to coordinate all of these important food and nutrition efforts across the federal government. So um, at Tufts, you know, we're continuing to work on this. This is very Im important through, through research and through direct uh, advocacy and outreach. We're, we're working with the, the various agencies in the federal government and the White House, also working with several state agencies. We continue to, to lead uh, um, conversations and education and outreach to bipartisan leaders in Congress. We're trying to convene both the private sector and nonprofits around these areas, especially the food sector and the healthcare sector. And we're working, uh, many of our faculty uh, and students and alumni are working with states and cities. We're doing our best to communicate and disseminate this information to the media and to the public. And we really, really want to ensure commitment, action, and accountability. The, the, there's a lot has happened in the last few years around U.S. policy, but we have to be sure that this moves forward uh, and that we get to uh, where we want to go. So uh, thank you so much. Um, pleased to be able to share these thoughts with you and look forward to any questions.